I'm Alan Jay. I'm the National Executive Director at ZOA. We're honored once again to host MK Danaluz, and I welcome you all to this latest edition of Zoom with ZOA. Update Israel at War, featuring former representative of ZOA in Israel and now MK Danaluz, with an introductory remarks by ZOA National President Mort Klein. Uh, welcome all with a special welcome to our friends in Canada who signed up through our esteemed co-sponsor, Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights. We hope and pray that all on this call are safe, remain safe and healthy, and please know that the IDF and all defenders of the Jewish state of Israel and the Jewish people across the globe are in our prayers. We have two programs coming up next week, one on February 6th, one on February 7th, a donor society event featuring MK Ohatal and an event open to all featuring Israeli activists and influencer Hillel Fold. My colleague Jackie will put the information about these events in the Zoom chat. If you'd like information about joining a ZOA donor society, Jackie, please put my email in the chat as well. Our guest is on a very tight schedule, so let's get right to it. All microphones will remain muted for the duration of the webinar. MK Aluz will give us an update on elements of Israel at war. And if time permits, Dan will give us, will answer a few questions. Please post your questions in the Zoom Q&A feature, but please be understanding if we don't get to your question. We'll send unanswered questions to MK Luz's office and hope to post the questions and answers when we post this webinar on our YouTube channel. ZOA National President Mort Klein requires no special introduction. The child of Holocaust survivors and economists in three U.S. administrations, friendly with international figures that most of us only read about in newspapers or see on television, singled out for special recognition at the 125th anniversary of the first Zionist Council held in Basel, Switzerland. In normal times, Mort is published in major print media and regularly appears on radio and TV. Mort's efforts since October 7th have simply been heroic. To formally introduce our guest speaker, <laughs> ZOA <laughs> National <laughs> President Mort <laughs> uh, Thank you, Alan. Thank you, everyone, for being with us for this very important discussion with a really a spectacular member of the Knesset. Uh, I've, it's a special honor for me to be introducing to you member of Knesset, Dan Aluz. Dan Aluz is a former Canadian mm -hmm. uh, who uh, studied law at McGill University, has a, a degree in public policy from Hebrew University. He made Ali a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he was a member of City Council of Jerusalem. I'm proud to say he was the ZOA representative in Israel for a number of years and did a great job. And uh, since then, he uh, ran for Knesset. He's a member of Knesset of the Likud Party. <laughs> He's one of the most sought-after analysts and uh, people uh, who, who want to hear from what's happening in Israel uh, by radio, TV, and other avenues. So we're really honored to have uh, MK Dan Luz. Uh, we're also deeply concerned, of course, of what's going on in Israel. We're worried about what's going on now. We want to know about the future, especially, uh, you know, what will happen uh, with Gaza. So I present to all of you... Uh, Really very special privilege of mine to introduce you, uh, M.K. Dan Luz. Dan, it, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Mort. Uh, I think that uh, last time we spoke together was uh, a little bit uh, after uh, October 7, uh, when Israel was honestly in shock. Uh, we saw uh, the face of evil revealed when Hamas attacked southern Israel and killed over 1,200 people in cold blood, just pure, uh, horrific murder. And when this evil was shown, it wasn't only because of the number of people that were killed, uh, but also in uh, the ways that were used in order to commit those murders, including burning children alive, uh, raping women and flaunting their bodies around Gaza afterwards, uh, kidnapping the elderly, uh, by the way, still being kidnapped 115 days afterwards and not getting the proper medication with the Red Cross doing very little uh, for that to happen. Now, since then, uh, we've been in a war. Uh, the war isn't only happening in Gaza. Uh, and what I'll try to do right now is to give you an update uh, on the various fronts that Israel is currently dealing with. I have a list here of, uh, I'd call it six and a half Fronts, and you'll understand when I get to them why I say and a half at the end uh, that we're engaged in right now. Uh, and to give you a short update on each of them, the main one is uh, definitely Gaza. 
uh, where most of our military action is taking place, but there are also uh, uh, other fronts. So uh, I'll start with Gaza. Uh, in Gaza right now, ever since the October 7th, uh, we've been really dealing with uh, uh, defeating Hamas in Gaza. It started really with uh, air raids, and afterwards we also had a ground uh, invasion, uh, where our goals in Gaza have been made very clear uh, from day one. Uh, we want to completely eradicate Hamas uh, and Islamic Jihad, by the way. We should remember that there are other terrorist groups also in Gaza that we need to take care of. Uh, the second goal is that we want to bring back our hostages. And the third goal is for us to ensure that Gaza will never be a threat to Israel, at least in the short term, obviously. Uh, uh, thousands of years from now, there's nothing we can really predict, but at least in the foreseeable future, that it will not be uh, a threat uh, to Israel anymore. Uh, and the way we've been doing that uh, is through strong military action. Uh, it started in northern Gaza. Uh, northern Gaza right now is uh, a place which has been pretty much, uh, Hamas has been defeated there pretty much. When it comes to uh, actual military organizations, and I'm talking about Hamas battalions. This is something that we need to understand. When we're say, talking about uh, Hamas, there are two levels to Hamas. There's the battalion level in which they are organized as an army, uh, but after you actually beat the battalion, uh, Hamas still has operatives, still has terrorists around, some of them hiding underground in tunnels, uh, and uh, hiding and waiting for an opportunity to have terrorist attacks against our soldiers or against uh, whatever they they, they want to attack, uh, and uh, throwing rockets still. And so while right now in northern Israel we beat the battalions of Hamas, we still have a lot of military action going on over there. It's more pinpointed, it's more specific, uh, it's against terrorists that come out of the tunnels or whatever it is, uh, but it's it's still going on, and we still have a very long way to go before defeating Hamas, even in northern Gaza. But still, I want to give a little bit of a picture of what we've achieved in northern Gaza. Uh, in northern Gaza, uh, almost all of the civilian population has left. Uh, they're right now uh, moved to uh, southern Gaza. Uh, and uh, what we have left is around 200,000 uh, civilians, between 200 and 300,000 civilians that are left uh, over there with Hamas operatives hidden over there and using guerrilla warfare. Again, not organized military action, but rather guerrilla warfare in order to try to hurt our soldiers. And this is what we're dealing with uh, in Northern Gaza. Uh, that's what in Israeli military language we call phase three, where phase one was uh, air, air, uh, air attacks in order to uh, remove threats from our for, uh, from our soldiers before they came in with ground uh, ground invasion. Uh, afterwards, uh, phase two was the uh, ground uh, war, and phase three is what we call the guerrilla attacks. Uh, and uh, this can happen uh, for a long time. We don't have any deadline. It will continue until we end up beating Hamas, and we feel that the terrorist group of Hamas. Uh, does not have any ability uh, to hurt Israel anymore from Gaza. This is in northern uh, in northern Gaza. When we come to the other sections of Gaza, then there's still some very intensive ground warfare going on uh, in uh, different places, including uh, Khan Yunus. This is where most of our uh, offensive right now is focused on. Uh, and there are areas that we haven't even begun uh, dealing with. Uh, the, mo the main area that we haven't begun de uh, dealing with is the Rafa uh, city, the city of Rafa, which is very close to Egypt uh, and includes a very, very large uh, population of civilians that have uh, moved from northern Gaza into Rafa. And so it makes uh, the issue a little bit more complicated, and it might be that we'll need to deal with it uh, only after we finish in Khan Yunus, uh, and we'll be able to uh, move the civilian population from Rafa uh, to another place in order to attack uh, Hamas. Uh, there are still some very open uh, questions when it comes to uh, Gaza. Uh, one of the main questions uh, is what will we do uh, 
what will we do and how will we do it in Rafa, uh, the, the city that's southernmost in Gaza, and that's on the Egyptian border. And that includes a very critical question, uh, which uh, Egypt also has an interest in, which is what we do in what, what is called the Philadelphia uh, Corridor. The Philadelphia Corridor is an area that separates Gaza uh, from Egypt. That Rafa, Rafa is actually a city that was once united and today has a division. Part of it is in Egypt, part of it is in, is in uh, Gaza. Uh, and uh, in the middle of it, there's what we call the Philadelphia Corridor, which is basically the, the internationally recognized border between Egypt and Gaza. Uh, and so in, on that border, we, uh, um, before the disengagement plan, we ruled uh, that uh, border. And unfortunately, uh, I obviously opposed the disengagement plan when it happened. But unfortunately, part of the disengagement plan, uh, they left, uh, Israel left the Philadelphia corridor. And that allowed for a lot of the arms smuggling uh, to happen from the Egyptian border uh, into Gaza, especially uh, during the time uh, when Morsi, uh, the, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, was ruling in Egypt. And so we have to right now uh, decide what we do with the Philadelphia corridor. I personally completely uh, support taking control of it once again and ensuring that it cannot be used in order to smuggle weapons uh, into Gaza anymore because I think that as long as we uh, allow for weapon smuggling uh, to happen, then uh, then Hamas uh, with its international friends can always regroup, rearm, and continue becoming a, a problem for Israel. And then we cannot get uh, to accomplishing the goals of the war. This is one question that we still have. Another question that has to do with northern Gaza I said that it's a, it's pretty much a, an empty land right now. You still have 200,000 uh, civilians, but that's a very low number. You used to have over a million uh, before, and it's pretty empty right now. And there's some people that are calling to uh, return, to let uh, the civilians uh, in a fr that went south, south to go back to the northern parts of Gaza. Uh, I personally completely oppose that. Uh, we, we're very... Uh, we're a very long way uh, from uh, dealing uh, with northern Gaza. As I said, uh, in the full way, there's still guerrilla warfare. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, of underground tunnels uh, that terrorists hide in. Uh, as uh, if we allow the civilians to go back there, then we'll make the uh, job uh, of the IDF very difficult over there. And we need to allow, however long it takes for Israel to completely secure these areas before any rash decision is made. At the current point, Israeli policy is not to allow uh, the, the civilians to go back uh, to northern Gaza. Uh, it's even more of a question when we know the widespread support that there is for Hamas among civilians. And so when we talk about civilians, right now they, they left as civilians, they might come back as terrorists. Uh, we, don't, we, we can't afford that. Uh, when we know that a place is still uh, still needs to be taken care of. Then we need to be uh, we need it to be as empty as possible from any distractions. Uh, the other question is what, everything that has to do with humanitarian aid. So there's a, a lot of humanitarian aid that's coming into Gaza. My personal opinion is that uh, Israel should have uh, asked that humanitarian aid be provided only in exchange for humanitarian uh, gestures. Uh, in other words, only when hostages are released uh, are we able to provide humanitarian aid. That should have been uh, our negotiating card. My opinion hasn't been uh, accepted, to be honest. Uh, and there's a lot of humanitarian going, uh, aid going into uh, Gaza. My personal position right now and my personal fight that I'm leading right now is to try and ensure that those uh, providing, those dis distributing this humanitarian aid in Gaza are not associated with Hamas because there's right now some some crazy paradox that's going on where the human where the IDF is trying to defeat Hamas and yet those uh, those people that are distributing the humanitarian aid are either UNRWA which is completely affiliated with Hamas as has been published in the news uh, recently but we've known that for years. Or if not UNRWA, Hamas itself sometimes distributes the humanitarian aid. Now, in areas where the IDF has already taken control 
to allow for Hamas or Hamas or uh, affiliated organizations to distribute humanitarian aid in a situation where we know that in Hamas, whoever distributes humanitarian aid is the person that's ruling because that's the most important thing right now to the civilians in Hamas in uh, Gaza. Uh, then that's a ridiculous uh, thing to do because you're 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 fighting against your own goals. Our goal is to uh, to remove the Hamas rule over Gaza, but then you're giving them the way for them to keep on uh, on ruling on Gaza through the humanitarian aid. And so that's one of my personal fights that I'm fighting right now. Those are some of the dilemmas that are still going on in Gaza. If there are other questions afterwards, if we have time, then I'll be able to uh, answer them. When it comes to the North, uh, we have an ongoing war uh, with Hezbollah. Uh, people don't call it a war, uh, but the truth is, is that uh, a war is going on with Hezbollah. Uh, it's not a full and intense war in the sense that Hezbollah is not showing all of its capabilities, and also Israel is not showing all of its capabilities. But we cannot deny that there have been a lot of rockets uh, from the north uh, into, uh, from Lebanon into northern Israel that have caused a lot of damage. And also Israel has caused a lot of damage to Hezbollah. Uh, right now, Israel's interest is to stay focused on Gaza. Because we know that that's where the terrorist attack happened on October 7. And that, to be honest, history has its eye on us right now. History is watching us and looking how we respond to such a horrible massacre. And we have to ensure that we give history a very good message, that we completely eradicate Hamas and give history a message <laughs> that the consequence of a massacre like October 7 is complete destruction. And so we want to keep laser focused on Hamas and get the job done there. However, I have to say, I'm not very optimistic when it comes to the North. Right now, it's in our interest not to uh, fight a war in the North. Uh, and it seems to be that Hezbollah believes that it's also, it's an it understands, to be honest, because it really isn't in its interest uh, to fight a war against Israel. Uh, so right now, that's the situation. However, we have tens of thousands uh, of Northern uh, residents uh, in Israel uh, that are currently not in their homes. They're living in hotels. They're pretty much almost as refugees in their own land. Uh, and they're not living in their own homes. And they say very clearly that they will not return to their homes until they know they can live there safely. And I'm not sure we will be able to attain that goal without a war with Hezbollah. Uh, right now, the Israeli government is adopting a policy of trying to keep this conflict on a low level. And not only that, but also trying to give a chance to the diplomatic route, uh, giving uh, an opportunity to the Americans that really want to give a chance to the uh, diplomatic route to bring some, uh, some um, results that will allow us as Israelis to feel safe and, and to ensure that Hezbollah is not a threat to us. Uh, but I have to be honest, I'm not very optimistic about that. And it might be that after we finish uh, doing what we need to uh, done uh, in Gaza, then we'll have to address the North. I do have to say that the North is much more difficult than the South because Hezbollah is a much stronger group than Hamas. Uh, and so it will be a much more complicated war. But one thing I can tell you for sure is that Israel is ready. Uh, and uh, it, even if it might be a war that will be challenging for Israel, it will be much more difficult uh, for Hezbollah and for Lebanon uh, if we get to that. And so I, I definitely think that it's in Hezbollah's interest to uh, wake up and uh, to accept uh, some of the American demands that will ensure uh, our safety uh, here in Israel. But if they don't, uh, then we're ready for that as well. Uh, there are two other fronts uh, that uh, exist uh, the, that have been uh, that have thrown rockets uh, at Israel. Uh, one is the from Yemen, the Houthis in Yemen, and the second one is from Iraq. There are militias, uh, Iranian-backed militias in Iran. Uh, when it comes to Iraq, uh, there's a long-standing conflict there between America uh, and Iraq over there, and uh, America is uh, is definitely uh, very involved over there. And when it comes to Yemen. Uh, right now, there's an international coalition 
uh, that is uh, that is fighting against the Houthis in order to not necessarily only defend Israel, uh, but also defend their own commercial interests uh, because of the commercial corridor that there is uh, going uh, uh, over there. Uh, and that th that those attacks uh, are actually not only hurting Israel, but they're, uh, they're hurting all of international trade. And, and so what we're doing right now in Israel, again, with our same interest of staying laser focused on, on Gaza, uh, that interest translates also that if there's other people uh, that are currently uh, trying to fight those militias uh, that are uh, that are also attacking Israel, but also attacking them, uh, then for us to allow them to try and do it, uh, if we need to interfere, however, uh, I promise you that Israel is ready for that as well. Uh, another front that there is right now, it's a front that has been relatively quiet uh, since October 7th. Uh, that's Judea and Samaria. In Judea and Samaria, the IDF, uh, I can tell you, is doing incredible work since October 7th, has arrested more people uh, since October 7th uh, than in all of uh, 2023. Uh, say, uh, before that. In other words, in the few months uh, from October to December, uh, more people were arrested than in all of uh, the beginning uh, of 2023. And the IDF is doing really, really good work uh, in Judea and Samaria in order to defeat Hamas. But the challenges are still existing. And one of the fears that we have, uh, at least I have, but I know that also many people within the government and the army are, are dealing with this, is that uh, we, we worry that uh, the Palestinian Authority, which we definitely don't trust, uh, and we know they're not Israeli lovers, uh, and so we worry that they will also uh, end up joining the fight. At this point, uh, they're not. Uh, and so that's part of the reason why the, this front is very quiet. However, again, as I said, I don't trust them. Uh, I don't believe that uh, they have uh, any longstanding interest in uh, staying out, out of it. Uh, right now, they're staying out of it because they hate Hamas probably more than they hate us or that it, their interest is to see uh, Hamas weakened. And so they're allowing us to uh, do the work. Uh, but uh, I, I don't trust them. Uh, and we have to keep a very close eye uh, on what happens there in order to ensure uh, that the uh, Palestinian security uh, forces uh, don't then end up turning their arms against us uh, instead of uh, having them uh, against Hamas. Uh, and so that's something that we have to be very careful. Now, the overarching theme, which is the sixth front uh, that there is, uh, is Iran. Uh, we all know that Iran is the main sponsor uh, of terrorism, that all the groups that I spoke about right now, whether it's Islamic Jihad, Hamas, the Houthis, the militias in, uh, in Iraq, all of those groups are heavily sponsored by Iran, and they, to some extent at least, take orders from Iran. Uh, and so it's clear that Iran's fingerprints are all over this multi-front challenge uh, that we're dealing with right now. Uh, having said that, uh, I right now there's no fear of a full-out war uh, against Iran. I do want to say that one of the things that we're still keeping a close eye on is Iran's nuclear program. Because if before uh, October 7th, we were telling the world that it was a very bad idea to give a genocidal regime nuclear weapons, people were looking at us and thinking that we were crazy calling them a genocidal regime. Uh, but now I think it's very clear how genocidal they are because their ideology, the ideology of Iran and the ideology of Hamas is exactly the same ideology. There's no difference. It's radical Islam, which is genocidal uh, and wants to kill all the Jews. They say it all the time. They want to wipe Israel off the map. Uh, and so having such a regime with nuclear weapons is something that Israel cannot accept. It's an existential threat to Israel. And therefore, if we come to such a point where we believe that they're on the verge of a nuclear weapon, then we'll have no choice uh, but to ensure that when we say that the military option is on the table, uh, we'll show them that we meant it. Uh, in other words, the military option is always on the table, also with Iran, uh, and we're keeping a close eye on that. Uh, but at this point, as I said, 
uh, there is no immediate threat uh, to a fallout war uh, with Iran. Uh, now, after I said all of these things, uh, I promised uh, that I that, that there were 6.5 uh, uh, fronts. The 0.5 is the right. dipl diplomatic front. Uh, we know that Israel has uh, has uh, also a lot of diplomatic challenges against it. Uh, the we saw the results in the Hague uh, of uh, what happened in the International Court of Justice. To me, this was a ridiculous theater of the absurd. Uh, it's as if uh, you would have taken the uh, the the Allied powers after Second World War uh, and put them on trial for defending the free world, and not only that, <laughs> but put some of the judges uh, in that court. Uh, as Nazi sympathizers, that they would serve as judges. That's exactly what the Hague was, the ICJ. Now, thank God, Israel did a very good job over there. There was a lot of arguments whether Israel should even show up there or not because it's a theater of the absurd. I personally was actually of the uh, of the opinion that they shouldn't show up, that they should just say that we we don't care about what's going on there because it's a uh, is a theater of the absurd. The Israeli uh, the Israeli defense team did do a good job. And they did. Uh, they did bring the result that the Hague didn't call on Israel to stop the war. However, still, uh, when you heard the result, the the, the decision of the judges, uh, you could hear very clearly uh, that they were one-sided. That they only spoke uh, about uh, the Palestinian perspective of things, uh, and that they required. Israel demanded that Israel does things that, by the way, Israel does anyways. And so that just shows you how one-sided they were, that Israel cares about civilian lives. If Israel cares about civilian lives, that Israel uh, lets in humanitarian aid, Israel lets in humanitarian aid. And so all of these things that Israel does anyways, those were the results of the judgment, which just shows you uh, how, uh, how uh, one-sided uh, they were. I will just end with one of the main issues that we're dealing with on the diplomatic front. And that's a strong push from our friends, from the United States, from England, from European countries, to see the result of this war uh, as the establishment of a Palestinian state. If that happens, that would be a historical uh, mistake. As I told you before, history is watching us. It's trying to see how does the Jewish people uh, answer after being attacked with such a massacre uh, as happened on October 7. And uh, to be honest, it's asking, are we still the same uh, Jews from the exile from Europe that don't defend themselves? Or are we Jews that know how to defend ourselves with an army that know how to eradicate our enemies? If the result that history sees is that the result of a massacre is a state, the result of a massacre is a diplomatic gain. That would be a historic mistake. We would be giving history a message that says that if you use violence, you'll be able to get diplomatic gains. If you use, if you do massacres, you'll be uh, rewarded with the state. I always oppose the Palestinian state, but even those who supported a Palestinian state before October 7th, and that might support it in the future. No one should agree that the result of October 7 should be a Palestinian state. That would turn Hamas as national heroes, as heroes for the Arab world, that would incentivize more and more violence, not only against Israel, but against the whole free world, and tell the Arab world that if you want to get to your goals, use violence, and that's how you'll get to them. And that would be a historical message. I call on you. I know ZOA does a lot of work on the issue of the Palestinian state. I call on everyone on this call to use every pressure that you have in the United States, in Canada, in England, Europe, Australia, in order to stop this ridiculous pressure against Israel, calling for it to cave in and to give a price to terror. That would be a huge historical mistake. Uh, I know that it's already uh, 8.30, <laughs> Alan. I I'm willing to take one or two questions, even though we're after the time. I'm willing to take one or two questions if you want. Uh, let, let Mort have let Mort have that first question. Go ahead, Mort. Uh, well, uh, that was a brilliant dissertation. We all should take heed to everything you just said. It was spectacularly 
accurate, honest, and forthright. Uh, <laughs> well, let me just quickly ask you, <laughs> do you support that the Arabs should stay out of Gaza or should we allow them back? Do you support the Jews should come back to Gaza and live there? And what is your position about the Biden Blinken policy toward Israel during this war? So uh, my position when it comes to Gaza on the day after, it's actually a, 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 a complex uh, position because I actually think that right now we're in a very long war uh, that, as I said in my, uh, in my uh, statement, uh, I don't think will end anytime soon. And we need everyone in Israel to stay united. That includes the right and the left. That includes people that want to see uh, Jewish communities in Gaza, uh, and I'm part of these people, uh, and includes also people who don't want to see that. And so I believe that even though I have my own positions, and I just told you what my position is, uh, we shouldn't emphasize them right now. We should wait for the war to be won, and afterwards open up the discussion in the public discussion in order for us to stay united, win this war as one united front, and afterwards we'll discuss uh, whatever, uh, what the day after will entail. I will say that we do have to put red lines. And that includes what I said, no to a Palestinian state, no to giving Gaza to the Palestinian Authority that incites terrorism, that uh, educates generations of Palestinians to hate Jews, that pays salaries uh, to the families of terrorists. So no, we have to put our red lines. But when it, it comes positively, uh, what to do? I'm actually against calls to right now discuss these things because I think they will only uh, enhance the divisions within Israel and we need a united front right now uh, in order to uh, to win this. When it comes to the Biden administration, I have to say that uh, the Biden administration has been uh, very, uh, very clear about the fact that it wants to, uh, that it stands with Israel and that it wants to see uh, Israel win this war against Gaza. But I want to tell you that it's not only the Biden administration, it's completely bipartisan. You have a lot of Republicans that have come to Israel also in order to show support. There have been some disagreements with the Biden administration. They're not a, a, a secret. I mean, myself spoke about the Palestinian state as one point where I definitely disagree with the Biden administration. The second point is the Palestinian Authority. Those are two things which I completely disagree with them. But overall, uh, they've been standing with Israel when it comes to the goal uh, of defeating Hamas. Uh, and uh, we're thankful for that. We're thankful for any support that we get. But we shouldn't forget, it's completely bipartisan. And it's important for Israel to uh, try and keep bipartisan support for, uh, however, uh, for as long as possible. Another question? One, one more? last question. More, sure, one last question. One? Did Gary Actually, have a question? Yeah, I do. I'm going to aggregate two questions, Dan, that, that have repeated a couple of times. And you just spoke to it a little bit, but it, it, it'll it blend right in. Um, with, um, with, with some element of supply, military supply from abroad in question, how confident are you that you can achieve your goals? And what has Israel done uh, to secure its munitions resupply if the war continues for a long time? And the last thing, if you can, can you speak just a little bit to the last uh, discovery about um, betrayal within UNRWA? And that'll be the last two. Sure. So the the, the first one, uh, the first question you, you you're asking, uh, Israel is is ready, uh, even when it comes to the number of munitions, uh, for all of the fronts that I described, even if they had to happen at the same time. We're ready. Uh, it would make our job much more difficult on many, many levels, including the numbers of soldiers that we have, including the number of weapons that we have and the munitions, etc. The job would be more difficult, but we would achieve our goals. We would be able to defend Israel and we would be able to win all of these wars at the same time. Uh, Israel has planned for these things for a long time, and so we're ready. However, our interest, as I said right now, is for us to be laser focused uh, on Gaza. I personally uh, think and believe that we shouldn't uh, in the long run, definitely not after what we've seen on October 7th and where the, the military uh, has become so relevant again uh, in Israel because we're at war. Uh, and so I personally think that we, in the long run, we shouldn't be dependent on foreign sources for weaponry. 
uh, and ammunition. We should uh, develop our own local uh, munition uh, supplies, uh, supply chains. Uh, and actually, the prime minister, I said that that's one of his uh, goals in the next budget and in the further budgets uh, in the next few years. Uh, and so I believe that, that that's a more healthy way to go. But I, I want you guys to uh, be calm and to know that uh, we, we will be able to win whatever uh, is brought against us uh, with the existing uh, scenario uh, as it is. And now about UNRWA, I think that uh, uh, anyone that's been following UNRWA over the years was not shocked. I mean, we always knew that UNRWA educated to terror. We always knew that UNRWA uh, facilities uh, were used by terrorists in order to attack Israel. And we knew that a lot of UNRWA employees were Hamas people, were Hamas members. So now we were able to find uh, and prove uh, in a very, very clear way that many UNRWA employees were part of the massacre. And so the world is a little bit waking up. But to be honest, it's, uh, it's I don't want to say too little too late because uh, it's never too late, right, to get things done. But it's uh, it's a little late. Uh, they they joined the game a little bit late, uh, and uh, th these are things that we knew for a very very long time. Uh, I believe that UNRWA shouldn't exist anymore. UNRWA is very existence is something which has no uh, no justification. I mean, there's another uh, agency in the UN that deals with refugees. Why do we need UNRWA? The only uh, the only uh, agency uh, in the UN that deals with a specific group of refugees is UNRWA for the Palestinians. And not only that, but they have a definition of refugees that ends up uh, continuing and bringing and, and making the, the refugee problem everlasting. Instead of encouraging UNRWA to, uh, re to rehabilitate uh, the, the refugees, uh, UNRWA has a definition in which all the des descendants of refugees are themselves considered refugees. And so they, instead of seeing the number of refugees over the years lower as they get rehabilitated or pass away, that's what happens in other agencies, you see the number of uh, refugees go up exponentially because UNRWA has, a, has actually a vested interest that there be as many uh, Palestinian refugees as possible because then they have a reason to exist. That's their only reason to exist. I think UNRWA needs to be a thing of the past. It needs to be closed down. Uh, and if there needs to be an alternative, then it needs to be an alternative that's based uh, on uh, facts and that doesn't support terror. Uh, that, that's one of the things that I think we'll, we'll have to see uh, also at the end of this war. Well, Dan, we have to respect your time. I know that hundreds of people are much more and better informed than they were just 30 minutes ago. So we're gonna let you go. For those on the call, I need you to know and understand that since October 7th, our work at COA has become only more challenging. We continue to keep Congress informed. As we speak, ZOA Government Relations Director Dan Pollock is in Washington, DC at a hearing on the Hill on UNRWA. And Dan, I assure you, we share your opinions. And with students on scores of campuses, we're fighting growing anti-Semitism on college campuses through our senior staff and our campus fellows. And we continue to make sure that the media is held to task and that the anti-Israel bias is challenged. We can only do this with your help. So please, everybody on the call, give generously to ZOA. We'll put our website in the chat again. We need your support to be effective. Please join us next week. This ends today's program. Everybody be safe.